Fascinating people, fascinating places. G'day and welcome to the Dan Mainwaring Podcast. This is where we talk to and about the famous and the infamous, the celebrated and the obscure, the well-known and the undiscovered. Interviews, articles and discussion from around the globe. We are go for main engine start, T minus six, five, four, three, two, one, and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Discovery with the Hubble Space Telescope, our window on the Universe. Mission Control Houston. The Hubble Telescope, launched in 1990, has forever changed our understanding of the Universe and our own cosmic past. In this episode, I explore the extraordinary story of one astronomer who has used the Hubble telescope for research purposes. But years before, he was among the astronauts who launched Hubble into space. It was the third of five missions the astronomer took part in aboard the NASA space shuttles. Professor Stephen Hawley, now of the University of Kansas, was among the crew of Discovery when Hubble was launched into space on the 25th of April, 1990. I recently had the opportunity to speak to Professor Hawley and began by asking him about his early interest in space and in becoming an astronaut. It actually started as a kid in Maryland. (laughs) I was born in Kansas. My parents moved away for a few years and then we moved back. But I was in grade school in Maryland when Al Shepard the first Mercury flight, and our teacher brought a transistor radio to class so that we could listen. I was fascinated by sending people into space and and the things NASA was doing. The thing I realized, however, was that, you know, Al Shepard was a military test pilot. All the astronauts were military test pilots. In fact, Dwight Eisenhower had sort of decreed that astronauts should be military test pilots. And consequently, it wasn't something that I thought I could ever do as a job because I wanted to be an astronomer. I remember thinking that one day we ought to have big observatories in space because space would be a really good place to conduct astronomical observations. And perhaps these observatories would need astronomers who were willing to go and and basically staff the observatories in space. And I thought, okay, well, maybe there's an outside chance that as an astronomer, I might, I might one day get the chance. You know, my interest persisted and I followed the space program closely and NASA seemed to be the organization that had men and women working to try to figure out how to do things that nobody knows how to do. And I thought, well, that's, that's a pretty interesting job to have. It wasn't actually until grad school that I suddenly found out that applying to be an astronaut was actually something I could do. I was in my final year working on on finishing up my thesis. And of course, I was doing what all of us did in our final year, and that's trying to find a job for next year. In those days, the way that worked was that universities or observatories or uh, national laboratories that were thinking of hiring would send letters to the department just to advertise open positions they might have. And so every day or two, I would go down to the bulletin board outside the office and see what new job postings there were. And one day, there was a letter that said NASA on it. And I started reading it. And I what I saw was this was an announcement that NASA was seeking applications for astronauts for this new thing called the space shuttle. What I discovered as I read the announcement was that, yes, they were still hiring the military test pilots, but they were also now hiring scientists and engineers. You didn't have to be a pilot to apply to be an astronaut. That was really a milestone for me. (laughs) I recall dropping everything I was working on, including writing my thesis, to go. I guess in those days you had to write to NASA for an applications package, and then they would send it out. And so I did that. I remember being a little surprised 
because it was the standard application form you fill out for any government job. So I filled it out and sent it back in and, and of course, never expected to be selected. I wanted to apply and I didn't realistically think I had a chance, but at least I wouldn't regret having missed the opportunity to send in an application. And I thought, you know, well, maybe if I'm really lucky as I go through this process, I might get far along that I would get a chance to go to Houston and see the Space Center and meet some astronauts. And that would be just great. So having been selected as an astronaut, which is every kid's dream, you were then tasked with deploying the Hubble telescope. What do you remember about the logistics of that mission? I'm thinking in terms of the size of the telescope, its complexity, carrying it up in a space shuttle, and then deploying it in space. Hubble was designed to be launched on the shuttle, and so the designers took full advantage of the available volume. HST really filled up the payload bay. And, of course, to do that, some of the appendages had to be stowed so that the telescope would fit into the payload bay. Our task was to get discovery with HST into the proper orbit and then use a robot arm on the shuttle to grab the telescope and lift it out of the payload bay, uh, deploy the antennas and the solar arrays, you know, a little bit like what James Webb just went through, although James Webb had far more things to deploy, <laughs> and it was there was no backup in case something went wrong. So my job was to operate the arm, and two of my crewmates, Kathy Sullivan and Bruce McCandless, were trained to do a spacewalk in the event that some of the deployments didn't happen properly. You know, on the surface, it, you know, it sounds fairly simple. You just lift the telescope out, let it go. It was actually quite a bit more complicated than that. There were a lot of restrictions on places where the sun could be, other restrictions on where the sun couldn't be. You were pointing restrictions to make sure that the ground could get commands into the telescope when they needed to. We needed to be able to visually see a lot of the deployments you know, with our eyes from the crew module. Another thing that was actually interesting was that it was so massive that as the telescope, as I was translating it out of the bay, that change in mass uh, with respect to discovery altered the center of gravity of the vehicle. And so the autopilot was unstable. The commander's job was to kind of manage the pointing of the orbiter and HST. And a lot of that he had to do manually because we couldn't use the automatic system because it really didn't understand right. how the CG could be so far above where it would expect it to be. I, as an astronomer, understood the potential significance of a large telescope in space. And I also knew how many people had spent significant portions of their career doing things that got us to that moment. Our part in all of this was, you know, in the great scheme of things, fairly small, although it was important at the time. So, yeah, I felt a fair amount of pressure to do everything, you know, obviously as best we could to give Hubble the best shot at being able to stay on orbit as a, a unique asset. So the launch of Hubble was your third mission in space, but your fourth mission was to repair Hubble. Was that something planned or unexpected? One of the key design features of HST was that it was recognized that historically we're very good at building things that function for a long time in space. The problem, though, is that it doesn't take too many years before a lot of the technology that's incorporated in your spacecraft is becoming obsolete. And so the original designers thought, well, wouldn't it be valuable if we could design Hubble in a way that made it possible to not only replace components that might fail, but as technology improves and instrumentation gets better, we can put more sophisticated instruments in HST and keep it state-of-the-art. And so that was always part of the plan. Now, originally, for probably a short time, the plan was that we would go get it and bring it back to Earth and do the upgrades and repairs on the ground and then relaunch it. I suspect that idea didn't last very long because that's, uh, you know, it's certainly risky for the telescope. 
it's better for the telescope if it doesn't have to come back to Earth. It was very complicated to figure out how to do all of the servicing tasks in orbit. That was a challenge that we knew was we were going to have to face, but it was a better challenge probably than the challenge of risking the telescope by bringing it home and having something break or having it contaminated or you know having to undergo another launch. Originally, Hubble had components, including the instruments, that were specifically designed to be replaced by astronauts in spacesuits. You would have connectors that were large and easy to maneuver, and you would have screws that were captive if you had to remove an instrument or a reaction wheel or something like that. So there are a number of components that were specifically designed to be so easy for a space-suited astronaut to handle. But over time, other things failed, or we decided that we could improve something that had not been originally intended to be replaced on orbit. And those tasks were far more challenging, and, and in some cases, special equipment had to be built in order to do that. But I think in every single case, we were always successful at being able to replace even the things that weren't intended to be replaced. When you're on a mission in the space shuttle, do you have any downtime or is your entire time consumed performing different tasks on the shuttle itself or experiments related to a particular project? It's different today on the space station, but when we were flying the shuttle, there really wasn't a scheduled downtime. You were generally scheduled supposedly 16 hours a day and you had eight hours for sleep. We would often use some of the sleep time to catch up on things that we were running behind on or prepare for what we were going to do the next day. Some of the work that you're scheduled for is fairly, you know, is, is sort of routine, like changing the filters that scrub the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere or mm -hmm. you know, going around and sweeping the filter dust off of the filters and the different uh, avionics. There's some uh, photography objectives usually on every flight. And so you'd spend some time, you know, trying to get some targets of interest for oceanographers or, or geologists. Not all of the activities are major, like, you know, deploying HST. We often participated in some medical experiments. I, I, we did that, I remember, on the HST deploy mission. We were busy, very busy for the first two days, getting prepped for the deployment and then actually doing the deployment. And then we didn't have off time, but it was a more relaxed pace for the next day or two because we were waiting to find out if we would have to go back to HST in the event of a failure, a specific failure. Uh -huh. The telescope was launched with a, a door over the open end of the telescope tube to protect it from contamination. And they didn't want us to open that door while the shuttle was still around. And so we deployed it with the door closed and then they were going to command it to open automatically 48 hours later. But if it didn't, then we were going to have to go back and re-rendezvous with Hubble and Bruce and Kathy would have to, do, I'd have to grab it with the arm and Bruce and Kathy would have to do a spacewalk to open the aperture door because it won't function if the door's closed. And so we were kind of hanging around. We were doing some medical experiments. We were doing some public affairs events. We were doing some photography, doing some exercise for a day or two before we got the news that the door had in fact opened and so we didn't have to worry about going back and then we could start working on the things we needed to do to get ready to come home. It's not a hectic pace all the time, but it is, you're generally supposed to be doing something all the time. Did you experience any physical or physiological effects from being in space? For example, I've always wondered if it's difficult to eat or to sleep when you're in space. Eating is not really a problem. Sleeping, I found, was. And people have different levels of different kinds of symptoms when they experience weightlessness. But one thing that's common to everybody is without the force of gravity pulling, you know, kind of fluids down to your feet, the fluids tend to redistribute themselves. And, and in particular, that you tend to get fluids more in your upper part of your body, including your head. And that gives most people a feeling like they've got a sinus cold or something. And, and in my case, it, would give me, it gave me a headache. The other thing that happens is you, you tend to get longer. Your spine stretches. In my case, I, I measured it, and it was about three quarters, I was about three quarters of an inch longer. 
you know, my, my most significant symptom was back pain mm-hmm. and that kept me from, from sleeping very well. You know, you can, you can take medicine. We, we fly a first aid kit, so you could take, you know, aspirin or something. But as I recall, the pharmaceuticals didn't work quite as well in weightlessness as they do on the ground. So right. that wasn't particularly effective. All of those symptoms tend to go away after three or four days. Your body does tend to figure out how to accommodate the change in, in the gravity vector. It's more of a problem early in the mission than it is later. How would you describe the impact Hubble has had in terms of our knowledge of the universe and space? I think it's hard to overstate it. (laughs) I really do. There were questions that we thought about before we took the telescope to space that Hubble might be able to address. And it has addressed those questions, but it has raised and answered so many more that I think when I used to talk before the flight, when I would be asked, I would talk about, you know, the promise of the Hubble telescope and how it would revolutionize our understanding of the universe. And I think that I was probably too pessimistic <laughs> mm-hmm. in terms of its impact. I mean, it is, it's really, truly rewritten the textbooks. That's, that's actually a good thing. Remember when Pluto was declared to be no longer a planet and people were complaining that, you know, now we have to rewrite the science books. Well... I always felt that that's, you know, if you have to rewrite the science books, that's a good thing, because that means you're smarter now. (laughs) There was something called the Key Project, and it was to determine the Hubble constant, which then tells you the age of the universe. And at the time we launched, I mean, it's hard to believe, I suppose, but when we launched HST, we didn't know the age of the universe to about a factor of two. It was somewhere between 10 and 20 billion years, based on several different studies, 10 billion was a problem because we were pretty sure there were stars older than that. And, you know, with Hubble now, we're able to say the universe is, you know, basically 13.7, 13.8 billion years old. Dark matter, we were kind of beginning to get a sense for that before HST, but HST has given us a far better, I don't know that I should say understanding because we don't really understand it. We understand how it behaves. And, of course, dark energy was a total shock. We have partnered HST with large ground-based observatories to locate and begin to understand the properties of some of the earliest galaxies formed in the universe, galaxies that were formed certainly when the universe was less than a billion years old. And that is interesting because, well, for a variety of reasons, but I I would say one of the reasons that Hubble was built in the first place was because, frankly, in the 60s and 70s, I think we had felt that we had done the best we could do from the ground. We had the Palomar Telescope, 200-inch telescope, California, and that was probably about as big a telescope as you could build and have it work. The Russians built a six-meter telescope, but it never worked that well. And so we felt if we're going to press you know, the state of the art in terms of being able to observe, we've got to do something different. And what we did different was put a, a modest, uh, well, maybe more than a modest size mirror in space. Well, it's above the atmosphere, uh, so you can see wavelengths that don't get easily to the ground, and you also can avoid the twinkle that is introduced by the turbulence of the atmosphere. But what happened in, in parallel, in a sense, was, yes, it was true that you couldn't build a big mirror much better than, much bigger than the 200-inch and have it work, but what if you did a version of what we now did on uh, James Webb, that is, build a big mirror out of a bunch of little mirrors. And so that technology suddenly sprung into being, and along with the computing capability that allowed little actuators to move the little mirror segments in a way that made them all operate together as one large mirror. And so now we have 10-meter telescopes on the ground, which, you know, certainly I had never thought was going to be a possibility. So... So one of the unexpected outcomes was HST in space and these new generation of large telescopes on the ground working together. You know, Hubble can find really interesting objects in things like the Hubble Deep Field. And then with the large ground-based telescopes, you can go just collect photons and get a spectrum. That has allowed us, that combination has allowed us to find really interesting objects that I say are very, very young in the age of the universe and be able to explore them. And 
you know, James Webb will follow up on that by being able to do it even better by observing in the infrared, finding hopefully the first galaxies and the first stars ever made in the universe. So that combination of, you know, more advanced techniques on the ground coupled with space-based assets probably made the, you know, scientific yield even more than anybody would have imagined. Recently, you actually had the chance to use Hubble yourself for your own research. Tell me about that experience. I was fortunate enough to be uh, on a team that wrote a proposal that was accepted. One of the challenges is, you know, the requests for time on Hubble far exceed the amount of time that's available to grant. And so it's very competitive. And so I was also part of a proposal that was not approved. So I always felt very fortunate to be part of a proposal team that did get approved. It actually goes back to when I was in grad school and a first year postdoc that I had discovered uh, sort of by chance an object which had a very bizarre spectrum. And I had spent some time trying to determine what the object might be and was only partially successful. Mm -hmm. And I had written a paper back in uh, 1981, I think. I produced the observations and and speculated to some extent on what the object could be, but I probably also said, you know, (laughs) it's kind of a mystery. And when I returned to KU after my NASA career, I got interested in seeing whether anybody had followed up on that work, and I learned that nobody had. And so I got interested in it again, and I got some observations from the University of Texas. I got some time at the University of Texas to observe it. But then I ran into uh, uh, another astronomer at one of the American Astronomical Society conferences, and, and he and I were chatting, and he described to me an object that he had been working on that was similar in many ways. And so we decided to collaborate, and we used Hubble Telescope to observe his, observe his object and to observe mine. And it turns out they're not the same objects. They are similar in many ways, but the object that I was primarily interested in is still something of a mystery, even with the Hubble observations in hand. So it's still work progressing, actually. So in a sense, it was like you finished your graduate work by going up into space and and deploying this telescope so you could kind of finish the project you started, right? (laughs) Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. So I, I left grad school, went to NASA so that I could put this telescope in space so that after NASA, I could come back and use the telescope to (laughs) get back to my original project. Take the bull by the horns, right? Yes, (laughs) right. One of the enduring questions for humanity has always been, are we alone? Having left Earth yourself, and as an expert in the field of astronomy, what are your thoughts on the possibility of some kind of life on other planets? We know that the components that make life possible are everywhere. We know that there are at least some planets outside the solar system where it looks like the you know, conditions, you know, temperature, gravity, might be appropriate. What we don't know is, even if you have all of those things, what's the likelihood that it's going to come to, they're all going to come together in a way that produces organisms. But my prejudice is that it seems like it would be more profoundly surprising if it didn't happen elsewhere. If it was so rare that in all of the billions of, of planets in the Milky Way, that you know, it couldn't have happened again. Again, you know, not necessarily you know, camels and aardvarks and things like that. Perhaps you know, simple organisms. I'm a believer that it's, it's likely, just because of the, what we've come to learn about how many worlds there are, how common the organic uh, or the elements are that you know, lead to organic compounds. We found, you know, organics all over the place in the solar system. You know, no life elsewhere yet, but, you know, at least the building blocks seem to be present. Well, stone the flame and crows. It's time for Dan to do the Harry. Watch out for the next podcast and follow Dan's activities at www.danielmainwaring.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please check my catalogue where you can learn more about space, 
and a whole variety of other topics. Here's a sneak peek. This is Houston, say again, please. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. That coronavirus is a work of God. As I often say, uh, UFOs took an interest in me before I took an interest in them. These officers would tell drug dealers they didn't care how much dope got sold. There were sectarian relations in Ireland, which had not abated since the 1690s or even since the 1640s. Well, I left grad school, went to NASA so that I could put this telescope in space so that after NASA I could come back and use the telescope to get back to my original project. It straddles fantasy and reality. I went to work the next day to tell my co-workers and a co-worker told me about the UFO he had seen the night before. Would you show me a church that hasn't filled their pews with divorce and remarriage and have young people fornicating. You show me that church. There were a number of spies, and he named five different forms. I definitely knew I was going to be an astronaut. I don't believe that the New Black Panther Party is one of the largest racist or anti-government, anti-Semitic groups. Hell, we've got in <laughs> They were guinea pigs because they simply didn't have the understanding of what they were doing. People make all kinds of mysteries about this stuff. Some people say they had telepathic contact. It's the most powerful feeling you could ever imagine. There were four crashes within four hours in four different lakes. The military investigated all of them and they never found the explanation to them. We, at the time, we really didn't know how humans would respond to those huge forces. When you have secrets, you're invariably going to have people who think there's a huge conspiracy at work. If ufology was a religion, Philip J. Glass would be Satan. You can call yourself anything. You can call yourself Pinocchio. You're not a Christian. You're a liar. We are still the peaceful people that was shipped over here. It's just, hey, we got guns too. It ain't so funny once the rabbit got the gun.